Hello and welcome to another modeling video. This is Alan from the McConnor Man at YouTube with a, another Q&A session. Last week on Friday I requested questions, shared around on social media a few days later and we've gotten quite a few uh, responses. It'll be a lot of fun, very interesting. Also dug up some very relevant and interesting questions throughout my channel while we're at it. The channel is faring well, smashing those goals like crazy. Not too fussed about subscription milestones anymore, but I probably should have an aftermarket set released by December, which should be 6K by then. Hopefully you'll be able to give away some handmade aftermarket sets straight from the big project. Speaking of which, Facebook has also really picked up considering I've only restarted a few months ago. All social media links down below and if you feel inclined or interested to check out, do post uh, quite a few interesting articles, references and uh, little gems across the internet I come across. For those playing at home, regarding the Salt Mines injection moulding project where I'm going to be releasing my own garage kit made out of styrene at a, a very affordable price in large numbers. I've uh, purchased the machine pictured in question. It was paid for last week and uh, got the invoice as well as the shipping notification tracking straight away. Fortunately as of making this video it is uh, caught up in customs. Working through that nothing um, not much of a big deal at all. Uh, in a very deep uh, process of designing molds got a couple of products worked out got a new timeline of uh, wishing to have a full kit released by Anamunga or around September next year to restart the caravan giveaway kit program that uh, Bandai has abandoned I have to thank everyone an outstanding amount of support regarding this absolute crazy project we'll see how far it takes it uh, the majority of it will be documented through the cutting design process, making the moulds and pressing them out. If other people want to play along, copy or do their own runs, I'll be fully supportive and uh, happy to talk to anyone. Even build a community out of it, very similar to the Resin uh, Wonder Festival scene. However, I still intend to release an aftermarket set by this Christmas January next year. In the way of uploads for the next month, we have the Providence Gundam and Mass Production Cubale overview videos, summarizing them up and showing the finished product videos, one after the other, a couple of tanks, as well as a sponsored video showcasing automotive clears being uh, thinned and processed to go through an airbrush on plastic models. On the kit front being currently worked on, we've got a 1144 Type 97, long term kit bash of a vintage desert style MSV Zaku on a modern HGUC frame, several kits involved, a Hasegawa Volkswagen with an Natasha scheme, E50 model collect tank, an egg plane as well as a Russian resin 72nd self-propelled gun. With all that out of the way we'll go straight into the questions. I won't pronounce all the names as I'll butcher it and make a fool of myself. I can now uh, do that in other aspects in the video. First question. I have Tamir Enamels, Games Workshop and Model Master Acrylics, Mr. Color Lacquers all sitting on my shelf. They are beginning to dry out. Can I save them? Now, we'll go in order of types with the picture. All of your lacquers, your Mr. Hobbies, whatnot, not a problem. Even if it becomes absolutely bone dry in the jar, all you have to do is refill it with thinner and add a substantial amount of retardant, uh, Mr. Retardant or any sort of uh, lacquer retardant using a pre-mixed Mr. Leveling Thinner also does the trick. Probably about 10% uh, retardant, the rest thinner, and that should be perfectly fine for uh, hand painting or airbrushing. With enamels, oils, there is a bit of a risk. I read about this quite recently. Once the oils or the oiliness of the paint 
evaporates out, you're in a bit of trouble, but the loss of thinner isn't too much. If you use something like gum terps or a really early oily turpentine or any sort of enamel white spirits mixed in with linseed oil, as long as you got it a bit oily, you can reconstitute it. Once it starts getting into a bit of a putty state, it's a bit of a risk. I'll still give it a go. It may remain lumpy or it may get back to a smoothie consistency. If it's uh, smooth, you're good. If it has uh, lumps throughout it, I suppose you could start straining and whatnot, but a lot of the good properties that you need are stuck in those lumps, and it's practically a dead paint. So add a bit of turpentine, give it a good mix, a good shake, and if it's a nice smooth consistency, your enamels are saved. Now, acrylics is a little harder, uh, both your alcohol or water-based. They go through a chemical change or a process as they start to dry, and there's no way of uh, really reversing it as it involves uh, air and whatnot. You can make an attempt to save them and squeeze a little bit of life out of it, but don't really like your chances. Sort of the same goes with your polyurethane based stuff, has a bit of flex, almost dries as a rubber. Once that starts to dry as a chemical reaction, there might be a cross contamination, there could have been quite a bit of air or time has passed. Uh, generally they die, but uh, your lacquers, your lacquers are always safe, your enamels is a race against time, get them oily, everything else is a complete write off. Uh, reason why I'm mostly keeping uh, lacquers at the moment and sort of uh, distance myself from everything else. Though generally I find very nice uh, airtight containers like your yeah, Tamir acrylics and whatnot, they keep quite well. Due to how poor the polyurethane in Games Workshop bottles are, they generally die and uh, that's the end of that I suppose. Hope it helps. Hasaki Art reports in just before the video got closed off. Hey man, I've known your work since the early days of Gunpla forums, lol. Anyway, my question is, do you have any plans to do heavy modding or scratch building an original mech design, or one that hasn't been made a model of? Now, it's always a pleasure to meet people from the early, mid, late 2000s during the forum scene online, well before any of the social media comes out and I posted quite a bit of work did some crazy uh, kit bashes scratch building from materials like styrene putty all that sort of thing they weren't very good uh, hand-me-down kits some of them no grades high grades a couple of bootlegs all that sort of thing you had websites propping up like uh, Fitch and Foo forums uh, the Bakuk uh, Bandai World Cup forums very uh, nostalgic it's where I sort of cut my teeth uh, took photos, put them on uh, photo uh, bucket, started the thread, and uh, we, we, we followed each other's work. Other people uh, followed me, sort of uh, moved from that once I got a bit of notoriety into uh, YouTube. But as the absolute uh, beginning start, I was a little too early for the good forums and was pretty much well and on my way to having a personalized platform during the Mecha Lounge days. And uh, there was a, a few other ones I just uh, can't remember, DC23 forums and all that. Uh, Don um, threw his hat into that. Popped my head into that in and out. You had some very seriously talented builders around during that time. And it's a... Uh, a time in the hobby that I hold very dear and I probably enjoyed interacting with people the absolute most. I'll get into the question after reminiscing after a while. Now besides the kitbashed Zaku that I've been working on for a little while, I'm taking a bit of a break from the Gundam scene, particularly working on a large diorama or a master grade, the whole Gunpla Builders World Cup or a flagship build of the year. Sort of focusing on uh, 3D printing, cutting, uh, all that sort of thing, and producing mold and tooling to create aftermarket parts, and eventually my own design mech kit from scratch that can be uh, molded and uh, sold as general uh, channel or uh, merchandise around the branding. I think it'd be very fun and interactive that uh, people could buy a personalized kit, build it, paint it, and 
enjoy it for what it is. That is uh, generally where I'm heading. It's going to be heavily documented in photos on social media and on this channel as well. The CAD process, getting the prototype um, SLA 3D printed, cleaning it up, test fitting it, painting it, doing the whole primed uh, prototype show off before the first uh, casting and doing little minor adjustments. The process seems very fresh, new, exciting to me, opposed to doing a crazy uh, 3D print, scratch build, kit bash, chopping up, airbrushing job or large diorama for a competition. What I do want to do on the side, of, of course I'm still going to be building models and whatnot, and with uh, tanks and the odd Gundam and resin kit and whatnot, I'd like to do a large uh, garage resin build. I've got a few in the stash and exploring the uh, Mushing Krieger scene where that has a lot of heavy modification and scratch building. I would absolutely love to embrace that style of model and building. Been following it for a long time and either jump on a Mush and Kriegy kit and bash it and chop it up quite heavily or go down the route of um, Kyo and uh, get some motorcycle parts, military kits and a lot of putty and parts and just build something absolutely uh, original and crazy that fits that scene as well as uh, share it around. Well, I get more into the Australian Mush and Krieger scene later on in the video from a requested shout out, but generally that's where my headspace is at the moment. Very excited for my new project, as well as just going through my usual antics, but I do get the hunger to uh, cut up styrene parts, use the ultrasonic knife, use a 3D printer, and busting out the odd Gundam and changing parts and whatnot is something that will never die out. But I think a break of just refinding my feet, what I used to do, creativity and all that, and uh, just getting back to where my base and uh, core modeling style used to be and updating it with uh, the new airbrushing skills and uh, technical bits and pieces I picked up along the way and just see where the new form is at at the moment. I'm still very happy to look at the QBLA as well as uh, the Providence Gundam and put that as uh, where I'm roughly at in the way of uh, my modeling journey. Thank you very much for the question. Don't ever be a stranger around here. Sigex asks, and a very nice thumbnail avatar by the way. I have used different grits of sandpaper but the nub marks does not want to disappear and I do not want to damage my kit and using foils is just too risky for me. I cut the nub mark little by little before using sandpaper. Thanks. So you've got the right idea of doing the double cut with nippers. You trim it down as uh, smooth as possible with the knife still leaving a nub and not gorging out the plastic. Though as you're uh, sanding it down, you're uh, not removing enough material to level that nub down to the surface of the plastic. And uh, using um, foils, which I believe it's sort of like bare metal, and you get that reflective finish or whatever paint or style of uh, finish you're trying to achieve, isn't uh, quite feasible at this point from my understanding. I think you might be afraid to use too coarse grit sandpaper and maybe your range of sandpaper is lacking uh, from the few videos and models i've been making i like to have a collection starting about 120 240 240 is very good for uh, plastic it's very coarse it is going to leave scratches and marks on your model but it removes a mass amount of uh, material until it's uh, absolutely flat and plain with the surface. So getting a small amount, folding it in half, dipping it in water so it's leaving less abrasion and damage to the plastic, you're able to wear down the material till it's nice and flat. Then as you use more high grades of sandpaper, you're actually filling in the abrasions, material layer by layer, until it's as smooth as what the original plastic came out of the mold. And this is very possible with what available on the airbrush, not airbrush, sandpaper market. Now, as I mentioned, 240, I find that removes uh, putty, nubs, all that sort of thing. And you go down to about 400-ish grit, 800-ish grit, 
you're starting to remove the scratch marks and the white distorted uh, bit behind if you're not painting your kit through stress of the nipper once you're going to 1000 grit 2000 grit you're polishing the surface until it's back to its original sheen and you can keep going up uh, the thousands so it's perfectly smooth for your uh, metallic finishes and whatnot and realistically for each uh, nub and each grade it's not very hard have all your sandpaper pre-cut pre-marked and when you cut it you sand it a little bit with every grit four five six sheets of paper and it'll be very very smooth for painting it's very easy you rock the pressures when it's a very low grit use as little force as possible for your fingers as you go up the grit you apply a little more force until you're in your thousands and you can go nice and hard without changing the shape of our curves pipes detail that sort of thing if you're skeptical that you might be removing too much material it's not going to work out you're not going to get rid of the scarring from the more coarse sandpaper uh, sand a part that doesn't matter or maybe some of your runners or uh, the inner part of the kit do a bit of practicing and if you're very happy with the finish apply it to where you need to do it for your project i hope this helps you out mate next question hi I'm having problems with Tamir gloss acrylics. When I spray thinned like any other paint, they don't look glossy at all, but more like glitter, with tons of shiny dots and not uniformed gloss. I've never used gloss paint before, so I'm completely lost what I'm doing wrong. If you know, I appreciate the help. Cheers. This isn't very an unusual problem. Uh, Tamir's paints aren't really renowned for their super deep sheen gloss you normally move to more lacquers if you're doing something like a showroom car or whatnot but they're quite notorious for being quite drab for vehicles figures ships all that sort of thing and even their gloss is uh, very light on and not uh, uniformed in a almost uh, wet look state it is possible to do though the buildup of the gloss sheen in paints is how much resin is involved in the paint to its uh, amount of pigment that's present what you may need to do is after you apply the gloss coat down and you let it shot dry apply a few layers of uh, Tamir gloss clear Give it a bit of a polish with uh, one, two, three, five thousand grit sandpaper and apply a few more coat, coats of clear. Be very generous with the clear paint with thinner. You can actually thin it far more down than you do normally with your paints. And once it's fully matured, Tamir clears and paints are quite chemically resistant to lacquer. So you might put a couple of coats of uh, lacquer gloss to help build up that wet look sheen it's more of a layer issue than what you're doing what you're doing is absolutely correct and okay that finish is quite standard you just need to use a different product to get your desired result hope this helps John Yosko a recurring commenter and a member who's contributed here before hi Alan how you going John why do water-based acrylics hate me Oh, I'm sure it's not you mate, don't worry. I've tried every thinner and flow improver available, but it always spits out of my airbrush in globs. I thought it was my airbrush's fault, but she seems to spray lacquers beautifully. Aha. Uh -huh. Should I just give up on water-based paint, or is there some technique that I don't know about? Second question. Is there a technique for using Alclad Gloss Black Base? We can definitely help with that. It always comes out spotty or orange peel for me. Now, John, if you're using polyurethanes or water-based, they are absolutely not compatible with lacquers whatsoever. And generally, sharing airbrushes with uh, two different types of uh, paints can cause you some problems. Once uh, the polyurethanes or water-based stuff just gets a sniff of lacquer, if you've done a good job cleaning it out, flushing it out, and flushed it with water or different thinner, up the times and even soak it, 
there's just one molecule in there, it's going to start turning into uh, jelly and it's going to have a lot of uh, issues spraying out. If you do wish to continue with Vallejo, Game Color, all of those uh, brands, maybe I suggest buying a second uh, airbrush or even one of the cheaper ones with a larger diameter nozzle and only keep that indigenously to these types of paints you'll f suddenly find that it's not going to be jamming up as quickly or frequently or turning into jelly as previously and your other airbrush will only stay to uh, lacquers alcohol based type of paints and it's going to flow and spray beautifully uh, polyurethanes do require a higher psi to be uniformed as well as its own brand of uh, thinner used and thoroughly flushed out with its uh, brand of cleaner water or water mixed in with uh, dishwashing detergent there are some people that talk about adding just a mere drop or a hint smaller than a drop of detergent uh, with the thinner for polyurethanes to um, give it some more surface tension and apply through an airbrush better but you cannot use the same tool with lacquers and water-based acrylics. However, if it happens to be alcohol-based like Tamir, Gunzi, that sort of thing, then you're probably being very lazy with your airbrush uh, maintenance. Normally those paints can take a uh, amount of uh, lacquer thinner or even thin it down to a certain percentage with uh, lacquer thinner and uh, keep its consistency quite nice. So there could be uh, other contaminants in it. But those two families, your uh, alcohol-based acrylics and your lacquers are completely compatible and can be used through the same machine. Now let's talk about the Alclad Gloss Black, be it the primer or just the base coat. The Alclad uh, base paint works a lot like the primers we've talked about from Mr. Hobby. Yeah, 500, 1000 grit stuff. It has a large property of micro fillers in it, a putty-like substance, to use the product sufficiently well. And I have the same problem with it on a bad day. You need to mix it and shake it thoroughly well. Add a ball bearing, put a stirrer in there and shake it and stir it a lot more than you would normally do so with a paint. Thin it down substantially with lacquer thinner and you need to make sure that your airbrush is absolutely up to scratch and very very well maintained and cleaned especially around the uh, nozzle. It does have a tendency of uh, collecting its very thick pigment and clogging them. Consider removing your nozzle Check for any buildup of uh, lint, tissue, that sort of thing. Give your airbrush a clean and if it's available to you, upgrade to a larger nozzle diameter such as 0.5 instead of 0.3 for a uh, lot easier smoother spray session. Same with uh, the polyurethane base. They will work a lot better from a wider nozzle and needle shape. I hope this answers your question, John. Let me know if you have any further problems. Merritt Philben writes in, probably a bit unrelated, but as a fan of your content, I think a huge upgrade to your channel would be to post your videos at 1080p. Would be great to see your content in that format. Keep up the great work. Looking forward to seeing how the plastic ejection machine stuff works out. Thank you very much for your kind feedback. I did get another uh, suggestion post this week regarding 1080p and that some struggle watching my content on a higher definition screen or uh, a large uh, smart television, those sort of appliances. I do have the ability and the equipment to record in 1080 as well as a camera and ran a smaller YouTube channel for about a dozen videos or so in 1080p as an experiment. With the equipment and editing software I had, I found it to be an absolute chore to uh, edit, process, store the information. I'm operating a seven, eight year old uh, laptop with outdated software, editing software and all that sort of thing. It is on the cards to upgrade. 
but it's something I've been putting off for a long time as upgrading the computer, the operating system, finding a new editing software and learning how to roll with that. Uh, Windows Movie Maker does have its points and makes pretty good very basic slideshow videos with uh, audio commentary does get very frustrating for you guys when I show the video side of things using my hands in motion and trying to see the detail of the airbrushing or the model spinning and all that I really want to upgrade that I've uh, recently bought a new house and I intend to migrate the studio there build a whole studio with the uh, mechanics to be building my kits with the injection molding machine and those projects and sort of have an open studio shop place for uh, people to visit and interact a bit of a side business build up once that huge uh, dream and upgrade does occur everything across the board is uh, getting updated but they'll also involve taking the channel offline for a period of time to work things out the move creating new content videos as well as finishing everything up some of the videos I create uh, many months in the process utilizing the same camera techniques and whatnot and there's about 20 to 30 uh, videos and projects that are open I make a bit of content save it in the files and once that model or projects finished edit it all up add a bit of voice commentary and it's finished I'll have to finish a proportion of those uh, videos uh, with the camera and the current technique as well as create new content on the uh, new computer and the new system so what I think I'll do is wrap everything up have a ton of content that will uh, upload and release itself on YouTube for a few months in adv advance and once all of that dries up finishes and completely done roll in the new style of content and the new way of uh, running things schedule all that sort of stuff got a lot of uh, dreams ambitions and ideas though it definitely requires a heavy upgrade in hardware software and my methods and ways of doing things not a big fan of change but it definitely does have to happen because once this machine or anything in the loop of uh, how I create content dies uh, the camera or the operating system the whole channels are uh, dead in the water and I keep uh, repairing and buying old stuff to keep this old uh, dying husk thing alive as I enjoy it as a hobby though it is something that is being planned upon and it's going to have uh, a huge impact once it's finally done in the future uh, thank you very much and please keep watching Megatroll2000 I hope you're not trolling me with this comment what would you recommend as the most time efficient way to remove nubs? Both for kits that you plan to paint and ones you don't. Also what kind of mask should one just starting out airbrushing buy to ensure their health? Well Megatron, the old method of a good set of nippers. Now there are things like your god hands and then you've also got your more chum cheap pinchy nippers that come with the basic sets. A really good middle ground one to get is uh, definitely the Tamir Mishima Ultimate Nippers. Somewhere around that, nice fine point, does an excellent cut and cut through a range of thicknesses of uh, sprues other than the God Hands which is very limited and does strategic cuts. You cut quite a large amount of uh, nub exposed, the piece out so you're not stressing the piece. Cut it further down the two cut method so it's a few mil trim it further with a very sharp hobby knife starting at the base and cutting upwards and do the same on the other side and when you've got a rounded off nub sand with a sanding stick sandpaper file until flat and polish with sandpaper for non-painting it can seem like a bunch of uh, steps and unnecessarily long opposed to cutting something for single cut uh, nippers like uh, god hands though with a bit of practice of cutting the part out at three points shorting the uh, nubs trimming it a bit with a knife and sanding it with two or three bits of sandpaper laid out and ready to go immediately you can actually practice to be pretty quick at the process though doing the correct preparation once you paint test fit assemble and finish your model you save your time later so if you put all the effort 
earlier on, once you're up the painting stage, you're not post test fitting and finding things are not fitting or lumps are appearing where you don't want it to be because a nub was not uh, correctly dealt with. It is still time consuming, though once you get quick at it and then you see the paint go down, the end pro process is so much quicker and you come out with a really refined, nice, dedicated looking model. Second part of your question, a face respirator. I think that's what you mean by mask and not masking the painting technique regarding tape, blue tack, all of that sort of thing. All you need is a basic face respirator that covers the mouth. You can change the cartridges and that it filters out fumes and gases, not just particles. They can be found at hardware stores, online, eBay, very cheap. Make sure that where you're buying it also has available spare cartridges to add to the mask when it starts to clog out. As you buy the mask, buy a bunch of cartridges just in case it becomes uh, obsolete or not available sometime in the future. If you've got money to spend, uh, 3M is worldwide renowned and you can always buy replacements anywhere. Thank you very much for the question. Hope that helps. This was posted on one of my airbrushing videos. David asks, have you tested any other low cost lubes? Say vegetable oil or baby oil? I know I have someone pulling their hair out over this question, but I have used beeswax as a hard lube for years without problems and baby oil as a general lube. Now this is a fantastic question as I've noticed in the comment section my airbrushing videos are becoming a bit controversial due to my method of uh, stripping down, lubricating the back section, putting back together and test spraying. People having concerns of my use of uh, Vaseline either gunking up the airbrush, damaging the airbrush or mixing with the paint causing a contaminant and the paint losing integrity, pigment or worse, not adhering well to the model. I've been using this method for a very long time. I like Vaseline, it's a very low velocity uh, lubricant. You got more chances of the paint flowing out into the lube than the lube flowing into the paint. There are proper uh, lubricants that you can get that's a very high velocity to the point of uh, sewing machine oils that Tamir and other brands uh, put out. I've tested it, not quite my thing, I found that uh, the Vaseline does an adequate job in cheap airbrushes and a less amount in nicer air airbrushes. Here's a rundown of experiments that I've done and how successful or not successful they've been and where I've led to my conclusion. The Vaseline has worked very well with uh, lacquers as well as acrylics and over a few years of uh, masking, painting and displaying many builds no adverse effects have been seen as well as others practicing the same thing and not reporting any issues. It is still worth testing and most importantly before you spray on the model test some lines, paint some spoons, see for yourself and not only after the first time you use it but every time you fit out your airbrush You've got to test it to make sure you've not done something wrong or there's some damage and it's going to land on your work. Now, the first one I've done that I really wanted a long lasting uh, lubricant that wouldn't dry out. I tried a uh, personal lube, mostly for casting bits and pieces out of epoxy putty. I used uh, KY Jelly or other uh, personal lube, being water based, it was very quick to clean up did not dry out over a period of time. It does gum up and thicken out, so its consistency is not uniformable. That made it so I didn't really want to use it that much, though the fact that it cleaned up really quickly and it didn't really contaminate paints was a first uh, go-to for airbrushes. Uh, Vaseline, very similar, quick to clean up with water, though it stays at the consistency throughout its life, exposed to air in the airbrush, thinner water, all that sort of stuff stuck to that. I have a concern with vegetable oil, even though you can clean that up, not as easily with uh, water, the same with baby lube, it's a very high velocity and it has a chance that it could seep into uh, the cup, but that's only my concern, I have not tested it out uh, thoroughly. I've also been experimenting with different types of uh, beeswaxes, 
I found that to be really good airtight sealant around nozzles and whatnot. I suppose if you heat it up and rub it down all, in all the different components and reset up your airbrush as it's rubbing up against each other, it's uh, going to stay dry. It's going to seal so paint does not um, go backwards and into the back end of the trigger and air solenoid and all that. It'll take a lot longer to lubricate up your airbrush from going into a liquid state to a solid state through heat. Though your airbrush is going to be in tip top shape for a lot longer period of time. And by soaking it in very hot water, it will pretty much uh, dissolve and clean up quite easily. So I reckon beeswax would be an amazing lubricant for airbrushes. And as well as the actual branded stuff, sewing machine oil would do the trick by just gently coating all the pieces with a Q-tip. I do heavily encourage experimentation, different lubricants and different jobs that different airbrushes suit different people and different styles depending on how your regime understanding of airbrushing and your style goes. No two people airbrush exactly the same. Some people like the way I do it with Vaseline, other people want a higher velocity, they like to use branded stuff. Don't really shame anyone for doing the wrong thing. You can let them know if you're comfortable, if it's within your style or not. Though what you must never use in your airbrush is silicon lubricant. And that can be a bit confusing as Tamiya does do an offering for slot cars. What this product does is if it makes any contact with paint, it destroys the adhesion 100%. Anything that, that stuff touches, paint will just slide off or never adhere to the surface. That batch of paint is ruined, that airbrush is potentially ruined and will need to be cleaned thoroughly and if it lands on the surface of a kit without being soaked and sanded or scrubbed in chemicals that patch of kit will never have paint adhere to that correctly and that could cause all sorts of problems that you will not diagnose easily. Uh, I like to recommend Vaseline as that's not going to cause problems though once you start venturing outside do not touch silicon lubricant do not have that involved uh, in your hobby, in your painting area, anywhere, unless it's uh, a resin casting thing, then do that sort of work um, away from your uh, regular uh, work area and thoroughly clean it with uh, detergent, water and whatever chemicals until you can start introducing paint to it. Hope that uh, definitely uh, tips some people off and helps them out, covers uh, that sort of controversy around my videos. Noob question, is this a top coat? That's a pretty good interesting point of discussion. Now top coat is not particularly a product or a type of paint but more so a process and this can be very tricky as some of the Japanese brands would put the term top coat on a rattle can or a bottle as it's preferredly used as a top coat but it can really be used as anything. The definition of a top coat is a layer of clear paint to protect, either be a paint, a surface, decals, a pigment, weathering effect, anything like that. And there's different products for different uses. Most of them are generally via rattle can for ease of a uniform surface of a large or small surface, gloss or matte, sometimes marketable as UV cut so it won't yellow over time being a high quality thing. They could be acrylic, they could be enamel. Generally, if it's in a rattle can, it's always a uh, lacquer. Uh, Mr. Hobby, Tamir, as well as testers are uh, noticeable brands. Though you can get automotive brands or hardware brands that are just as good. Uh, lacquer as well, and it applies as well, though being local and a larger can, you can save quite a bit of money. Though the fact is, it's a clear gloss or matte paint and can be used in any stage of modeling. Top coats can however be an issue if you're dealing with different paints that are not compatible with each other such as a polyurethane or an acrylic water based paint and you're putting a lacquer on top the lacquer could eat in, do damage or whatnot. as well as if you've got a very delicate polished high sheen metallic effect adding a top coat could uh, frost it or cause issues so you need to make sure there's compatibility of the type of top coat which is the type of paint being used on another paint so just treat it as any other paint that's uh, transparent when you're designing for the effect the brand of paints all that sort of thing top coat is also very useful for masks 
and then you put another bit of paint on top no longer a top coat or for buffing polishing then putting a final seal to improve its finish El Chen in response to the US gadget ultrasonic cutter great review thank you so much how much did it cost did you look into the difference between your machine and this Honda Electronics ultrasonic cutter USW334 I guess cutting metal and wood are out of the question. Thanks again. Now, generally these machines retail around the four five hundred dollar mark from its indigenous country. The original Honda one was far more expensive as it was one of the very first to hit the market. The US gadget one sort of made the price a bit cheaper and eventually a South Korean uh, model dropping the price even further via a Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign. I have used uh, two of the models, the US Gadget as well as the Wonder Cutter, all seen in the picture, though all three of them share a very similar component that does the same performance as well as output. So the box doesn't really change anything. In the way of uh, metal and wood, metal's a big no, wood only soft, very very thin. Woods like balsa. Generally the materials covered by Wonder Cutter is things like your various types of uh, plastics and uh, rubbers, cork, paper, cardboard, that sort of thing. In the uh, picture provided, the active uh, components to all of this is the oscillator which is the last metal rod, has a horn, attaches a knife. There's a few uh, variants out on the market uh, pictured to the right. The middle one is the one I'm familiar with and the one I've seen commonly in uh, products. There's large boxier older industrial ones and I assume they use the other two models. And uh, they're virtually all the same depending on how good the rubber, rubber packers are if it senses it's vibrating too much and cuts out and other controls all that sort of thing the oscillator is the most expensive component so if you've got an opportunity to buy an older model or a second hand model generally jump on it they will eventually lose its calibration you can replace the rubber rings improve the inside pack it a bit better though generally the performance is going to remain the same as long as the oscillator is uh, fine and vibrating away the amount of times it needs to and the handle's got nice uh, sound condition, so is isn't going to break down, the electricals can generally be repaired. Hope that uh, interests anybody. Now, just quickly, someone's trying to throw a bit of shade, a Webby NZ, uh, calling out another YouTuber after saying you were for the community unsubscribed not too fussed about that really but having a closer look what he's exactly uh, talking about in past I have called out people for putting out a uh, mass amount of misinformation or misinforming modelers about things like uh, competition techniques methods or almost having an overbearing uh, effect that uh, isn't going to really have a massive uh, backlash in uh, fan people running in my way and causing issues. In this case, I haven't actually targeted any particular YouTube, but a number of them who are more in the snapping reviewing community. Uh, back in the not too long ago, YouTube has cut monetization to a bunch of channels that were not grossing watch hours over 40,000 hours in a year which generally doesn't really generate any income or ad revenue I thought that this was uh, not in spirit of the modeling community or YouTube as a platform this was clearly stated in QNN session 26 of the 1st 2018 uh, this year not really a big deal I don't see anything behind it Rolling on to Facebook and coming to the end, Tristan asks, I want a shout out for being just plain awesome. And he got exactly that. Tristan is a long time model who's been following me and I've been following him as well. A very talented kit basher and 
heavy modification modeling artist. It works primarily with older style of uh, glue together mecha models painted together as a very unique style and eventually has uh, stepped up and started the Australian Mushing Krieger Builders Group. Here's a link down below. It is an amazing community. You'll see his uh, very interesting and handcrafted uh, models that I'm a big fan of, as well as many other uh, talents in this uh, Mushing Krieger community, as well as uh, people who are being introduced to it in Australia and uh, getting themselves known and just forming connections, sourcing models, all of that sort of thing. Awesome Facebook group. Join it. Check it out see the builds, learn about uh, this style of modeling if you're not into it. As always, all links in the description section down below, including social media and Tristan's Mush and Krieger group. And uh, wow, we're really uh, pumped through that. These videos used to be so quick and easy to make and uh, been a bit involved, uh, sunk and easy four and a half hours into editing it all up and we'll put it straight into processing. Thank you very much for watching. As always, until next time, if you've uh, missed out in leaving a comment, uh, always feel free to comment and interact in any video or uh, comment sections. If it's a uh, phrase like a question, happy to help out. Always usually jump onto those and build up some sort of discussion or discord or something. Next month, we'll uh, definitely do it again and you guys get the chance to ask questions, interact or get a shout out as you wish. This video was definitely fantastic in ironing out and putting out what's happening in the future regarding the channel, the salt mines project, the injection molding machine and all that until I can actually have a formalized and proper video uh, out. I'll be doing a video on uh, the injection molding machine very very soon and fleshed it out a lot further and at some point a uh, conclusion of the year vlog where things stand, how things are doing all that general jazz. Uh, for those who are interested in sticking around and listening to the uh, full long-winded version, but thank you for your support, uh, checking it out, contributions and all of that. We'll definitely catch you guys next week with uh, more videos and everything you generally enjoy. Catch you guys next time.